third grade teacher, third or fourth grade teacher, I can't remember which one it was, but she um, had moved from Hawaii um, and was the secretary uh, at the San Jose Bible College. It just happened that she was in charge of the work study program, and it just happened that she had jobs open for my brother and I. My brother worked in the bookstore, and I worked as a custodian, groundskeeper, and then I eventually moved into the gym and uh, had, a, had a job. It, it, it just happened that that summer, my, my, um, my uncle and uh, his family um, wanted to spend the summer over in Maui to visit family. And they said, you know, you can stay in our house and, and you know, we have a freezer and we want you to eat up all the food because it's not going to be too good after three months. And it just happened that they had a vehicle and they said, we want you to um, drive the vehicle around because we don't want it sitting for all that time. And you know, I think of all these coincidences in my life that, that I don't call them coincidences. I, I, I see that it is God working in a mighty way to, to have His purpose, His will accomplished in my life. Now, what am I sharing all that for? Some of it I've shared to you before, and some of it, of course, there's some of you new people that never heard that before about what has happened in my life. I mean, I can go on and on, and i got story after story on, on if you will step out in faith and do what God calls you to do, He's going to have mighty things that, uh, after a while, it's not surprising uh, what the Lord can do. I mean, after all, he owns the cows on a thousand hills, right? He owns everything. In fact, I don't own anything. Everything that I have belongs to him. Because, you know, if, if God wanted to, he can take everything away. Just like that. And so we have to put our faith and trust in him. And when I think of all the people that we have ministered to here at Elias Christian Church, and the ones that have been able to get, and what I mean by get it is placing God number one in their life and not sidetracking and let other things get in their way, then they have been able to stay on the path to maturity in Jesus Christ. We've ministered to a lot of people in this community. A lot of them have gone other places in the country, maybe all over the world. I, I, I haven't kept track of all the people that this congregation has ministered to. But there are a lot of them that seems like they get all excited. They, they, they want to serve the Lord, but they allow things to sidetrack them. Like, um, uh, I had to work late, so I can't come. Or I couldn't sleep at night, so I can't come. We can make all kinds of excuses why we cannot put God number one in our life. But I know for sure that if we don't, our life is not going to be right. And pretty soon, we're going to end up back where we began. And when I think about the many people in our nation that have died. This is Punchbowl National Cemetery, which is in Hawaii, on the island of Oahu. Um, and all the people that are buried there from the wars sacrificed their life so that we can have the freedom that we enjoy today. What's this? Nine of ours. Patriot's yeah. Day. Remember what happened? How long ago was that? 16 years ago? It, it seems like just yesterday for some of us, right? I remember that morning, uh, Anita was getting ready to go to work. I was still in bed. She was putting her makeup and she had the TV on. And it, we saw the event unfold before our eyes. Where the, plane, the second plane we saw, we watched live, the second plane crashed into that second twin tower. 
Do you remember what happened right after that? America just turned to God. They, they were devoted to God and patriotic, but it didn't take very long for them to forget. And you know, it's kind of like the Israelites, right? The Israelites, they get all excited about God and, and they, they start serving Him, but then they forget about what God has done and they kind of, like some of the people, stray away, pretty soon they're down into their <coughs> junk. You know what I'm talking about? <coughs> some of us have been there before, right? <coughs> so I thought, okay, what do you talk about on Memorial Day? There's a, a passage. It says, uh, when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from the right where the priests were standing, and carry them over with you to put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together 12 men uh, he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and, and said to him, Go over <coughs> before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take a stone and put it on your shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you in the future. And when your children ask you, what, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. And they took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites. As the Lord had told Joshua... And they carried them over with them to their camp where they put them down. And Joshua set up 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant stood. And, and they are there to this day. And now the priests who carried the Ark remain standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything the Lord had commanded Joshua was done by the people. Just as Moses had directed Joshua, the people hurried over. And as soon as all of them had crossed the ark of the Lord, and the priest came to the other side while the people watched. Can you imagine what that must have been like? There's a river flowing. And they've experienced this before. Remind, you know, about the Red Sea, crossing the Red Sea on dry ground, not muddy, but it was dry. They crossed over. They seen that happen, and now they seen the Jordan, and they were going to walk over into the promised land. And they're watching this. The men of Reuben, Gad, and the, the half the tribe of Manasseh crossed over, ready for battle in front of the Israelites, as Moses had directed them. About 40,000 armed for battle, crossed over before the Lord to the plains of Jericho for war. Now you remember what happened right before that, right? I uh, sent out the, the 12 spies, right? And, and 10 of them came back and said, well, they're like giants. We can't do this. But two people were faithful. Joshua and Caleb. They didn't care about what it looked like and how fierce that looked like. He said, we can do this. God is with us. <laughs> that day the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all of Israel, and they stood in awe of him all the days of his life, just as they had stood in awe of Moses. And then the Lord said to Joshua, Command the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant, uh, the covenant law, to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests, come out of the Jordan. And the priest came up out of the river, carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord's 
No sooner had they set their feet on the dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to their places and ran at the flood stage as before. And on the tenth day of the first month, the people went up from Jordan and camped at Gilead on the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilead the twelve stones they had taken out from the Jordan. And he said to the Israelites, In the future, when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones mean? Tell them that Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground, for the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until they had crossed over. The Lord your God did, did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea. And when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. And he did this so that the people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful, and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. Right? I'm going to have Brian come up right now. And uh, Brian was a mess when he met Randy. <laughs> <laughs> Were you a mess? Yes, I was. You can use this one. Can you? So he became a mess after he met me? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, when Russell called me last night and asked if I do my testimony, a uh, little bit of it, um, I said sure, and then of course I had second thoughts about it, and you know, uh, I figured, well, you know, uh, I've never done it in church before, um, and that was the big thing about it. Um, you know, I I uh, I go to uh, AA and I go to celebrate recovery, and I'm in recovery, and and um, you know, I, I believe that those are the things that brought me to the Lord. Um, and so, how I'm going to introduce myself is, uh, you know, I'm Ryan, I'm a grateful believer in Christ, and, uh, you know, I battle today with uh, daily life struggles. Um, once before, I struggled with alcohol and drugs. Um, they controlled my life in, in a sense that an addict, if you're not an addict, you will never understand. Um, but in Celebrate Recover, we have... Um, there's all kinds of struggles in life, and if you struggle with something in life that takes away from your, then away from God, then that's similar, I think. Um, you know, uh, but when I say it controlled my life, it controlled every aspect of my life. Um, where um, you know, I, I had myself convinced that I was going to die um, from drugs and alcohol. Um, where I didn't know there was a way out. Um, you know, there was, I tried to get sober for, uh, I don't even know, I mean, I think around 16 or 17 years. I was in and out of treatments, jails, prison, halfway houses, three quarter way houses. Um, and every single time I went to those things, not jail and prison per se, but treatments and the halfway houses and stuff like that, I, I, I actually had in my mind that I wanted to get sober. Um, I knew. I knew I was on a path to uh, total destruction, and I was hurting everybody around me, including myself. And uh, I never could grasp the concept of what it meant to have faith in Jesus and believing in Jesus. I never did think they were different. And um, when I came to that point, and that is when I met Randy and when I met Russell, um, for some reason, it was then that something clicked in my mind. And uh, in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it says we were rocketed in this fourth dimension. And I believe that's what happened to me. Um, because, um, you know, I completely gave myself over to Jesus, as in the sense where Amen. I completely trust in Him that no matter what happens in my life, good or bad, It's in my favor, and uh, well, um, you know, I, I struggle with uh, with other things today, like anger and stuff like that, and you know, but I was in this bondage for such a long time that, you know, honestly, I had no no sense of what it felt like to feel what I feel today. 
Um, <sighs> I didn't expect this. <laughs> um, I feel uh, free. Um, free of self. Uh, it was, uh, you know, it's an amazing feeling that uh, I, one time I didn't ever think I'd feel. Um, I was totally caught up in self. And, um, you know, I thought I could uh, control my life. And um, it's not my life to control. It's God's life. Right on. And uh, Amen to that. I find it a lot easier to let him control my life than myself. And uh, I feel that that is what has brought me this peace and this joy in life today. I'm not perfect, I still get angry at times, but I used to be rageful, and uh, I used to hate everybody, and including myself, and today I can love people, love myself, and love God. And uh, there was a time I didn't ever think that was gonna be possible. Mm -hmm. That's all I He knew it was probably not the right thing to do because um, he knew Anita was a, an alcoholic and um, he, he knew that it was going to be misery for me. Uh, but you know what? I thought, well, Anita, <laughs> she's going to share her story. I might need some. I brought my own. <laughs> well, I know how it is when I share my testimony. I get real weepy, so. And I don't like that, but Russell says it's a good thing. Um, I'm Anita. I'm a recovering alcoholic. Recovered, probably is a better word. Um, I've been sober almost 10 years. And I am very grateful that Jesus died for me, too. He didn't forget me, so I'm not going to forget him. Um, I went off to Maryland after I graduated from the University of Nebraska, Nebraska Wesleyan to get my master's degree, and I did do that. But I did a lot of other things, too. I fell in with a bad crowd and got into a party lifestyle, which is kind of what you do in Washington, D.C. when you're young and single. Um, I got my master's degree, and I also got a DUI, my very first one. Um, lots of other things happened. I'm not going to drag that out here. It's pretty awful stuff. Uh, but I came back, I ran away, and there's a saying in AA that wherever you go, there you are. I came back here, and here I was. I hadn't changed, and so the same things started happening. I met Russell at um, a Westway event for single people. I was drinking at the time. I can't really say there was a time I wasn't drinking back then. <coughs> um, he was determined that we would make a good couple. So he proposed and I kept saying yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And finally I, I thought, this is a good man. You, you'll never have a, a good man like that. 
in your life again? So I said, yes, 